If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. At Horse Chats today, we've got Jennifer Cicillo. Now, Jennifer, as you remember, in um, episode 742 is a movement body awareness specialist for equestrian. And now we've got it back to go a little bit more depth into a couple of different areas. But before we do that, I just want to introduce International Horse College or remind you about International Horse College. I'm sure if you've listened to the chats, you've heard about uh, International Horse College before. International Horse College is on a mission to improve the welfare of horses around the world through the safe education of their riders, handlers and trainers. International Horse College is also a very thorough selection of courses for the wide variety of people who already work in the horse industry or are preparing to work in the horse industry. For more information about these government accredited courses, go to internationalhorsecollege.com. Now, Jennifer, are you there? I sure am, and happy to be here. <laughs> happy to have you too, Jennifer. Now, today we're going to talk about the work of Eckhart Miners, is that right? That is who we are going to chat about today, that's correct. But who is he? You know, why is his work so important? What's, what's, just tell us a little bit more about him and, and about the work that he does. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Well, Eckhart Miners um, is, or was, he's actually retired now, but a professor of movement and kinesiology from Germany in a small town called Lüneburg. Um, and he spent his entire life researching how human beings move most efficiently, effectively, and has studied really what I would call all of the Western mind-body movement um, philosophies, so Alexander, Feldenkrais, Pilates, um, as well as um, things, something called brain gym, He's looked at the neuroscience behind movement, the embryologic development of movement. He's looked at movement up one side and down the other side. And how he ended up helping riders is that his wife was a rider. And I don't know if many of your folks have ever been to Germany, but it's not uncommon in Germany for a larger stable to have an indoor riding school. And then sort of above it, a lounge slash restaurant slash bar. So it's a very social thing. And he, being the dutiful husband, would go to watch his wife take these riding lessons, sitting up with his buddies upstairs, having a beer or whatever, and watching people ride and noticing that their movement was almost never in sync with the horse's movement or not as effective and as efficient as he thought it could be. And he thought, you know what, I can take all of the work that um, I, he usually worked with racket sports athletes. He said, but you know what, I, I can take my work and apply it to equestrians. And so he started doing that. And it really created, at least for me, a movement, ha, 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 um, in how do two moving beings sink into one? And he's come up with a variety of areas where people stop moving as efficiently as they did, let's say, when they were, I'm going to say, three, four, five, six years old. Okay, we're going to, we'll pass over the little babies who are still stumbling and trying to find their balance. But if you think about, you know, a younger child, you know, assuming they haven't had a big accident or whatever, you know, they're very mobile, they're very balanced, they fall over, they get up. They're pretty fairly ambidextrous. They move very, very naturally. But, you know, as we get older, um, things start to happen. We don't play like we used to. You know, playing, running around outside and, you know, doing whatever you want to do puts your body in all different sorts of planes. You reach up over your head, you reach behind you, you twist, you turn, you bend over, you get up. There, movement is so three-dimensional, but as we get older, we tend to go in one more in one plane. We go straight ahead. We don't spend so much time twisting and turning and arching and, and rotating. 
So, you know, it's kind of that move it or lose it kind of thing. So we start to narrow our movement possibilities. So that's one thing that starts to happen. The second thing that starts to happen is, let's face it, we've all had injuries. I don't care who you are. You've tripped over a step. You've been in a car accident. You fell on a pair of skis, whatever. Or perhaps you had to have an operation and you had tissue cut and stitched and Once that's happened, your body learns compensating ways to move, and those become part of who you are. So all of those things create a body that is less efficient and effective. So if you take that less efficient and effective body and you put it on a horse's body, so now we're adding energy to that body, those body inefficiencies, those human body inefficiencies become exacerbated. So what he decided to do is sort of to look at human bodies and where they mostly get stuck and where movement doesn't flow correctly. I mean, movement should be a flow. I think of it as being a slinky. And, you know, if you hold a slinky and you kind of just let it fall towards the ground. It has this very buoyant, elastic, supple feel to it. Well, that's how movement should be. But if you imagine if I put a kink in the slinky or I tied two or three pieces of the slinky together and I did that, the movement would not be very pretty. It would be a little erratic. So human bodies all sort of kind of get stuck in similar places. So, um, like the first place I'd like to actually talk about is our head and our neck. So when you talk about the head and neck, can you also talk about, you know, that's a place that we get stuck. Tell us about getting stuck, but also about the exercises. So if we can talk about the head and neck first, that'd be great. Yeah. And the exercises then how to fix them. Yeah, please. Absolutely. That is going to be the plan. So if you think about it, Our heads, depending on who you are, weigh between 10 and 15 pounds. And if, if, if you, if it's not stacked properly right above your spine, it's going to cause, if you, if your head is down a little bit, you know, you see a lot of people with a walk head down kind of posture or how many people ride with their heads down all the time. That creates a lot of stress and strain on the back of your neck because basically your body says, hey, head, I don't want you to fall off the front. I'm going to get tight and try to hold on to you. Um, It's not so much anymore, but there are probably plenty of us out there who can remember phones that actually had cords and we'd crook them. Um, uh, I'm right-handed, so I would crook it between my left ear and my left shoulder and your one side would get shorter or tighter. And so the movement is not going to flow very well. Your head is also the initiator of your movement. So if you, for instance, were walking down the street and you decided to make a 90 degree turn, if you sat and watched people, they turn with their head first and the rest of their body goes. But that movement's not going to be very efficient if there's some kink in there. Um, So anyway, and I also like people to think about, I think we've all, we're talking about really our pole. So that's right where our head is attached to our neck. And I think all of us who are riders know what it feels like to ride a horse that's tight in its pole. It's just not supple. It's not flowing. It's rigid. So the same thing happens to us. So we're going to do a couple of really easy exercises and everybody's not sitting there in the comfort of their own home can do this. I'm getting ready myself. So yes, please. (laughs) Yep. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Okay. So we're going to do a little test to see if this works. All right. Without any stress or strain and without overlooking with your eyeballs, I want you to everybody to turn your head to the right, just to where it naturally stops and like find a bead on whatever that is. So I'm looking at a, one of my paintings in my, my bedroom. So that's one spot. Then I'm going to turn and I'm going to look to the left, find my spot there. So that's my natural range of motion if I didn't do anything. All right. So here's the weird thing that we're going to do. We're not going to move our head. We're going to move our eyeballs. Okay. Because this is, this, is, this is a really interesting brain body thing. So what I want you to start to do with your eyeballs is start to look left and right. 
just keep looking left and right. And again, we don't do this very often. <laughs> I'm going to say probably uh, people are like, ah, never, you crazy lady. What does this have to do with riding? But you'll see in a second as we keep doing that. And it was interesting. I'm just going to tell you what I'm feeling. When I went to look to the right, I didn't have very good range of motion. It was a little stuck there. You know, with all this COVID, I have not gone in for my massages or my chiropractic. So my body's, even though I do all this all the time, it's still a little creaky. But to the left, I could move pretty easily. Now, as I'm moving my eyes back and forth to the left and to the right, my eyeballs are having a lot harder time going to the right than to the left. I don't know if you feel that or not. But I'm going to keep yakking as you keep doing this because you have to do it for a couple seconds for it to really work. And while we're doing this, the other thing I want you to think about in terms of head is what's actually in, going on inside your head. Not right now. I'm kind of killing two birds with one stone, so to speak. But how a negative thought or chatter or over-concentration can really mess up what's going on with your writing as well. Okay, that's probably plenty. We're going to stop. So get yourself back together. Now, very easily, you're going to turn your head to the right. Ah, yeah. And turn your head to the left. And I am I have my, I have Glennis there. Did you get any more range of motion? I did, actually. Yeah, it's really bizarre. It's really bizarre. We have, I have a, a variety of other things you can do with your eyes. Um, it is a brain body kind of a thing to, to help with that. But what it's telling, your eyes are telling your head, hey, you can go, you can turn further. You can turn further. You can turn further. Now we're going to do one more. This really isn't an exercise, but I want all the listeners out there to do it too. I want everybody to find their pole. And I think everybody knows if you go to the base of your skull, you've got that little indentation there. You know where your horse's skull is. And, and I want you to massage in that indentation and around that indentation. And I want you to really dig in there. Don't be, don't be wussy about it. Really dig in there. Really, really dig. And I'm doing it too. And when I do this to people... <laughs> They're always going, ouch, I didn't think you should do it that hard. I'm like, yeah, do it that hard. Everybody, once they've worked with me a few times, they're always like, oh, God, here she comes. <laughs> Get her away from me. <laughs> all right, that should be plenty. All right, we're going to look. all look to the right again, and then I'll look to the left again. And did that help? Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're going to do one more. We're going to massage, and you'll find when you're doing these things, certain ones work better for different people, depending on where they're stuck. So um, you're going to, uh, Glennis, Glenn, well, she may have a headset on. I have a phone, so I, I can do. only do this with <laughs> one hand. But the rest of you can take two hands, and I want you to put them right on your jaw, um, jaw joint. So way up in by the front of your ears, there's another indentation there. And I want you to really massage the living daylights out of that. Really push in there and all around there. So a lot of people, again, I'm going to stop doing that because it's making me sound kind of weird when I'm talking, um, is, you know, they, they clench their jaws. There's, again, there's been a lot of stress going on with all the COVID. So people clench their jaws or they grind their teeth or they chew hard or they talk a lot. Or, and these muscles get super, super tight. And all of these muscles that we've talked about, our, our eye muscles, our jaw muscles, the back of our neck, they all feed into our neck and they can all cause restrictions in our neck. So once you rub the living daylights out of your jaws, you're going to try that test one more time and you're going to look to the right and you're going to look to the left. And if we had a whole hour, we could do a whole hour just on getting this more supple to the point where you go, oh my gosh, I feel like an owl. I didn't even realize I could move that much, but you can, and it's all in there. Um, just because you are, are unable to do, to move in a certain way right now, doesn't mean that your body doesn't have the understanding of how to do that. All right. So one more right and left. Yeah. And it will that 
that ability to move, so now we're just, we've just really worked on that top joint, will over time start to cascade through your whole spine. So that is the first place that many, many, many people get stuck. And I mean, think about it if you've been in a car crash or, you know, whatever. Yep. Um, yep. You know, keep talking about that, but I was hoping you'd do, as another point, the pelvis. You know, the sitting trot, even in the walk, you know, as an instructor, just the walk people are blocked. And, and then, of course, you know, even more so, and the canter, but more so sitting trot. You know, that's probably yeah, the most. Without, without, a, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, so it's actually interesting because the re- one of the reasons why we start with the neck is, um, and this is true in horses too, is that your pole and your SI joints, there is a neural connection there. And if you massage your pole, you will help release your SI joints. So let me explain what an SI joint is in case people don't know what it is. So if you think about your pelvis, it is actually three bones. The one in the middle, if, if you're looking at someone from behind, I'm looking at their buns. In the middle, uh, the flat part is your sacrum, uh, that big flat thing. And then the two elephant ears on either side, the ilium. So you've got the SI, sacroiliac, I'm sorry, the iliac, the sacroiliac joints are those two areas that hold those three bones together. And I liken those, they're, they're not like this at all, but I liken them to being like Velcroed together. Because even though your pelvis seems like it's one big hard thing, there is actual movement and flexibility in between those bones that are necessary for proper movement. So by working on our pole, we've already helped that, all right? But then let's talk about our pelvis and why it is such a difficult issue for so many, many riders. So let's first talk about the idea of being in neutral. So to me, when I talk about a neutral pelvis, it's a big buzzword. You can talk about neutral spine. What that means to me is that it has the ability to move in every direction evenly and equally. So the pelvis is really attached to your body in three places, your two hip joints, and then your lumbar sacral joints. So right at the edge of your spine. So I have three joints plus those two SI joints, so five joints that all need to be able to move to the best of their ability and equally. So in order for the pelvis to move forward and back correctly, kind of like a swing, all of those joints have to be very mobile. If they're not mobile, your pelvis will get stuck in a position that really doesn't allow it to swing properly. And this is really probably the most major cause of, uh, I'll use the sitting trot, of not being able to sit the trot. And so what happens usually is that if you would look at somebody's pelvis that's trying to sit the trot that isn't sitting it well, the front, the top of it is facing forward relative to the back of it. So the tail is out the back, the tummy is out the front. They tend to have a little bit of a sway back. Okay. And the legs tend to want to go forward a little bit. So let's talk about what's causing that imbalance in your pelvis. And let's think about what, again, what now let's think, I I, I live in Chicago, so I'm going to think about the O'Hare airport. Well, not many people are there, but, and I love watching people walk around and not in a creepy way, but (laughs) (laughs) like to watch them walk around and think about, I think, I think in general, compared to Americans, Australians tend to be a little bit more fit than we do over here, but we'll see a lot of people here with sort of saggy tummies and really tight lower backs. And if you watch them walk, their legs aren't swinging properly. So what that's telling me is that relatively front to back, the muscles in my my back are not necessarily stronger, but they're tighter. And the muscles in my front are longer and weaker. So what does that mean to help right that pelvis up? I need to do at core work 
to strengthen that tummy and I have to do some work on my back to lengthen it. And then in the legs tends to be, um, if you watch most people walk, they pull their leg up with their quads as opposed to pushing with their hamstrings and their glutes. So again, the front of their leg is tight, so it pulls it forward and the back of the leg and the glute is soft, so it allows it to go backwards. So as soon as your pelvis is in that, what's called an anterior tilt, what starts to happen is as the power of the horse's hind legs come up and meet your pelvis, instead of your pelvis being in a position that it can swing forward and absorb the energy, it essentially hits your two seat bones and propels you up and out of the saddle. And once that happens, everything else starts happening. You fall forward, you grip with your thighs, you crunch forward, you think you're going to fall off, and it just cascades down. So super, super important to try to find neutral, all right? So one way to do that in the saddle is hop on. Well, first of all, let me even go back further. Before you even get on, Have a good check with your look at your saddle. Make sure that the lowest point of your saddle, where you're supposed to be sitting, is absolutely parallel to the ground. If it has an angle one way or the other, usually dropped in the back, it's going to cause your pelvis to do the same thing. So first of all, make sure what you're sitting on is going to give you some help and then go from there. All right. So one way I like to find neutral is, and you have to have a good horse and somebody hold your horse, is I will sit in my saddle. I will take both of my legs and I'll put them up and over the front of the saddle and kind of scoot my tailbone under. That's usually where neutral is. Your back will get flatter. Your pubic bone will come up. And then you're going to try to one leg at a time, try to take one leg down and the other leg down. What'll probably happen is you'll go, oh, John, I can't get my legs where I'm supposed to have my legs. And the only way I can get my legs is get my pelvis messed up. And it's, I really think that until you get your pelvis right, where your legs are, not that important because you'll never really be able to ride correctly until you get your pelvis in the right place. So let's, think about some things that we can do um, to kind of start to find a little bit of motion, that rocking motion that I'm talking about. Can you move? Can you move in your pelvis? And there are a lot of people who really can't. So for all of you guys sitting out there, I want you to sit on the edge of your chair, okay, and really feel your two seat bumps, okay? And I want you to rock your body a little forward and a little back. And I want you to envision that they're two big marbles. They're really not shaped like that at all, but just go with me here. There are two big marbles. And I want you to roll to the front of your marble and then roll to the back of your marble. Roll to the front of your marble, roll to the back of your marble. Now, can you do that and keep your upper body relatively still? All right. So if I roll to the back of my marble, I'm pulling my pubic bone up with my lower abs, get to the back, then I release them. And then to go to the front of my marbles, I kind of push my tail out. And I pull my pubic bone up to get to the back, then I pull my tailbone back. So find that rocking motion, all right? And then try to settle in the middle. Now, if you are completely in uh, neutral, if you put your hand on your pubic bone, your pubic bone should be completely perpendicular to the floor. Completely perpendicular. Not off by an eighth of a millimeter, but super perpendicular to the floor. And then you should be able to move that a little bit, again, forward and back. When I'm teaching someone to sit the trot, although I want that pubic bone to be perpendicular to the floor so that people can find the proper motion, what I'll actually have them do 
is pull their pubic bone up and roll a little bit onto the back of their seat bones. It may cause lots of other ugly things that most riding instructors don't want to have happen, like shoulders falling forward, legs falling forward, all of that stuff, which in the long run I want to get away from. But it will explain to the body, the human body, that it is possible to have your pelvis flow in this correct position. It will get your obliques and your your abs starting to flex. It will start to get your lower back to let go, to start to feel how that pelvis has to be able to move. All right. Now, another good exercise, again, to get just get some more movement, again, sitting on the edge of your chair, keeping your upper body still, can you hike one hip up, basically now sitting just on one seat bone, and then switch, and then switch, and then switch, and then switch. Switch. Now, again, I should be able to do this. And if I was looking in a mirror, my shoulders are going to stay absolutely stable if I can do that well. If you can't do it well and you need still need to experiment and play and try to find that motion, then by all means, to get it, you let your upper body move. It's, this is all playful and experimental. How do I find, how do I re-explain to my body that, oh, yeah. I can move like this. My body, my legs do move like this. My hips move like this. I can pull my pubic bone up. I can pull my tailbone under. I can press my lower back flat. It's all in there. It's just a little hidden right now. Yeah. I like the way that you're going to one area and saying, right, let's work on that area. Don't worry about the rest. Just focus on that area and one thing at a time. It Don't worry about the rest. Because your brain can only really concentrate on one thing at a time. And if I said, you know, again, to someone, let's say that they they can't sit the trot. It's just bad. But the goal is to sit the trot. I want that to happen. What the rest is happening, I'm not, I don't, I don't care about right now. Over time, as my back lengthens and as my tummy gets stronger and my hips start to move better, I'll be able to sit up a little taller. I'll be able to stretch myself a little longer. But if I said to someone, well, get in that position and now stretch, what's going to happen is immediately that pelvis is going to pop back into the other position. And yeah, maybe somebody's heels look good and their head looks good, but if the middle isn't working, it's not going to work. Just isn't going to work. Um, so, um, and then moving on. Okay. So this is the next place we're going to do next exercise. Um, I'm going to move down. I mean, truly the pelvis to me is the most important thing. The next little piece are our legs. Okay. So again, if your hip joints are really tight, if your hip flexors are tight, your hip flexors are really a cool muscle. I, they're actually my favorite muscle in the whole body. It's the psoas. And your hip flexor, we're going to start at the bottom of it. It actually attaches to the inside of your thigh, way in there. Then it comes up and it crosses over your hip joint. And then it kind of spreads out, kind of like peanut butter. And it goes up through your pelvis. It lines your pelvis. Then it comes back into a cord and then it runs up the inner side of your spine all the way up to your diaphragm, okay? So that's an awfully long muscle that if it gets shortened, either way up at the diaphragm or way down at your legs, is going to pull your legs forward. If your legs are pulled forward, again, you're out of balance. When you're out of balance, you start to hold. Your body is going to do stuff for itself, whether it's conscious or not, to say, I'm not falling off this horse. So your legs are pulling up, all right? Once your legs pull up and once you clamp on with your thighs, it locks your hip joint. Once your hip joint is locked, movement can't follow, you're going to bounce, all right? It just is what it is. The other thing in legs that we see a lot are lower legs that swing, that we can't get a stability in the lower leg. 
Well, if you are locked in your hip, rolled in and closed too much in your knee, it automatically pops the leg off and it can ro- kind of pendulum back and forth. So again, I'm going to talk about the balance of the musculature of the legs. So if I'm always really tight in my thighs. That What that tells me is relative to the outside, my inner thighs are tighter than my outer thighs and my tush, all right? If you watch people walk, you'll see a lot of people that are kind of knock-kneed. And as a rider, if you think about old cowboys and you always saw them with, with really rounded barrel-shaped legs... That's because their inner thighs are really stretched out and can really wrap around those horses. Plus, I think they've just gotten a little, I don't know, not deformed. That would be a bad thing to say. But anyway, for most people, we're going to have to work the outside of our legs so that they can hang a little bit away from the horse relatively as opposed to clamped. If that happens, then your lower leg will be able to drape and hold on. It's almost as if you, if you remember back all the little cute little Felwell cartoons of all the little girls and their thighs would be on the horse and their leg, their lower legs would be sticking way out. It's a kind of the same thing. We have to let go in our thighs to let those drape. I'm not saying pull them off, but it's all an all relative kind of a thing. And then moving down a little bit further, we're going to go to our calves, ankles, feet, all of those joints, all of those joints in your feet, in your ankles, in your knees, they ha- again have to be supple, kind of like if, you, if you've ever seen a slow motion video of like a cheetah running and everything, or even a horse running, but cheetah horses have hooves, so it's not as dramatic. They open and they flex and then they claw up and then they push and they flex and they claw up and it's very fluid. That is, again, the same feeling we actually want in our feet and our ankles, especially when we're sitting. It's a little bit different in jumping, but even then, you need to be able to flex your ankle. And um, I want you to allow the motion to drape through your heel. Let it drop, let it drop, not forcing it to drop. I think it seems, well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe it's just because I'm older and I don't wear high heels as much anymore. But, you know, if you're a woman who's worn high heels her whole life, your ankle has, again, adapted to that. And pushing your heel down, stretching your Achilles tendon down, you do not get a lot of motion happening there. So one thing that's kind of interesting with your body, and this is going to be our next kind of thing to do, So it's really easy. I mean, I can be sitting here and I can do ankle circles and point and flex, and I can do that. But if another thing performs the motion on you, it is more effective. So for instance, if you cross your right leg over your left and you use both of your hands to do some ankle circles and really just let your ankle be absolutely relaxed and blobby and just let your hands do the work. And your hands are going to start to teach, oh, look, you can move a little bit further. You can move a little bit further. If you do it just with your ankle and then you do it with your hands, you'll see you'll get more more range of motion. You're going to do that both ways. You're also going to be doing the point and flex using your hands to move your feet and to show them, hey, yeah, you can move, you can move, you can move, you can move, you can move. Um, So that's one thing on the bottom. I'm going to go back up to those inner thighs. This is a great exercise, but it does take a prop. Um, You need a, eh, you could use a soccer ball. You could use a kid's ball. It's a be about, uh, mm, yeah, like soccer ball size. You're going to stand up. You're going to take that ball. It's going to feel weird. It's going to look weird. I do a lot of weird things. You're going to stuff it up all the way to your crotch, way up there, and give it a good hug. And then you're going to do a forward fold. You're just going to flop over. 
And you're just going to stand there and you're going to breathe for, I don't know, 30 seconds or so. Slowly stand up. You move the ball down an inch. You flop over again. You keep doing that all the way to the tops of your knees. You don't want to do that right on your knee joint. That is like the most wonderful acupressure release for your inner thighs you'll ever have. It's a fantastic way to loosen all of that up. Okay. Yes, yes. I'm sort of doing those exercises and going through. I think all the exercises you've you've said, I, I can just see them working. I can see them working not only with myself, but with my students, you know? And Absolutely. You know what? And I always think it's funny. Very oftentimes I'll teach groups of, you know, pony clubbers or whatever, and their moms are around. And the moms, I'll go, you know, if we're doing these lessons, you know, come on, you can do them with. And every time, the kids don't necessarily say this. The moms always go, oh, my God, I feel so much better. <laughs> like, yeah, it is just good for your bodies. And then I always think good hamstring stretches are a positive because we sit so much. Our, every, our whole upper leg gets tight. So a good quad stretch. Um, and then a good hamstring stretch, always a good thing to do. Um, just make sure that when you do do a quad stretch, that you don't let your tailbone go out behind you. You want to pull your pubic bone up, sort of anchor the top of your quad by pulling your pubic bone up and then let your leg go out behind you and sort of do kind of a lunge kind of a thing to do that. Don't want to get that lower back tightening at all. All right. We are going on to part four, which is a really big part. It's sort of everything in the middle. Okay. So so like this shoulders, sternum, spine. And I could talk an hour about all of these things. But again, if I go back to my slinky, that will be the spine. You know, your spine has many, many bones in it and many, many muscles attached to all of their bones. And it's very easy for one to get a little tight and then the move, motion stops. And then if motion stops cascading up and down through your spine, it will find another place to escape. That energy will escape somewhere. You know, sometimes I'll find someone who they cannot control their right arm. Can't do it has nothing to do with their arm. It's the way their spine is stuck somewhere. It can't go anywhere else and it gets moving out through there. If we work on their spine and get that moving correctly, those kind of things go away. Shoulders. Again, lots of stress in our lives, lots of computers, lots of driving, lots of people curled in and forward. Um, and you know, as soon as that happens, I'm sitting here doing it now, I can feel the upper part of the back of my spine stiffening. But then if I do the normal, let's pull our shoulders way back, then that stiffens as well. All right. So we have to come up with a way. How do I, how do I get my shoulders back to where they need to be without getting stiff? We're going to get to that in a second. The other place I want to think about, and people really don't think about this area very much at all, is your sternum. If you think about that sternum, all of your pectoral muscles go into it, the front of your neck muscles go into it, your obliques come into it, your diaphragm comes into it. We've got a ton of muscles that all attach around the front of that sternum area. And Again, as we tend to go in, I'll call it the computer slouch, in all those muscles right around your sternum get really super tight. So I would invite you to use your fingers as we're sitting here and sort of, I don't know, start up right where your sternum and your ribs come together and just start palpating down. Mine are sore than sore because I haven't done much and it hurts when I go down that sternum and then up the other side. And I would bet most people's are. So you can do just what I'm doing as a sort of like a little self-massage to kind of open that up a little bit. 
The other thing you can do to help with that, and again, for me, it hurts because I don't do it enough, is to lay on my tummy on a foam roller and roll to one side of my sternum and kind of jiggle it there and then roll to the other side, jiggle it there, trying to get that tissue to open up a little bit and let let go. Um, we're going to also think about, oh, my uh, shoulder rolls. So I want everybody to practice this. Again, sit up towards the front of your chair and I want you to do plain old double shoulder rolls. So Shoulders go forward, up, and back. Shoulders go forward, up, and back. Shoulders, and feel what it feels like. Forward, up, and back. And once they get back, they're hold. All right? So just feel that. Now we're going to do it differently, and I want you to see if you feel anything different. We're going to do them one arm at a time. So let's start with the right arm. You're going to take that shoulder. You're going to take it forward a little bit. You're going to take it up a little bit. You're going to roll it way, 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 way back, and then let it flop. Then you go to the other arm, a little forward, a little up, way back and flop. Other arm, a little forward, a little up, way back and flop. Last time on the other arm, a little forward, a little up, way back and flop. So when I do it that way, the tension that I feel in my upper back when I do it with both shoulders at the same time, I don't feel like I have that. No, you're right because, yeah, I feel like if I'm doing it just you know, you do both shoulders and that's uh, an exercise. But then when you do one shoulder and then the other shoulder, you'd think, hmm, I've gone a little bit further back here once I've done both shoulders individually. Exactly. I get my arm farther back without tension, which is what I want, <laughs> you know, again, because so many people are so rolled forward. So I think that's a much better way to do that. So when I'm giving somebody lunge line lessons or, um, or even just when they're walking around on the horse, I always have them do these just one armed shoulder rolls. It really kind of helps open that area up without getting stiff and tight. All right. Let's see here. Um, so is that, is that the exercises there? for the uh, shoulder, sternum, and spine? That's that. For right now, that's, uh, well, let's do one more just for the spine. So we can, again, we can sit really right at the end of our chair and feet are flat on the floor. And if you're perfect, your second toe is facing straight ahead, not your big toe, okay? So you're sitting there. And I want everyone to just drop their chin towards your chest. <clears throat> and as, if you're sitting up against a wall, you're going to roll down one bone in your neck and hold, then another, then another, then another, one bone, one bone, one bone, one bone until you can't go any further. And there's no judging here. Then to go back up, you're going to go up one bone, one bone, one bone, one bone, one bone until you're up. Okay. So that's one way to do that. That's just straighten up. And now what I want you to do is ever so slightly, like an inch, rotate to the right. Okay. And now you're going to roll down, chin to chest, roll, roll, roll down to where you can't go any further. Now stay down there, rotate around to the left one inch and roll up the left side of your spine. And now you're still facing the left a little bit. You're going to roll down, rotate around to the right. And then roll up. And then we need to finish. We have to get you even. So let's go back to the center and roll all the way down. And then roll all the way back up. So any kind of motion. And I like to add a little bit of rotation because it, again, our spines move every single which way, you know, so side bends. I mean, I have hundreds of these things, but. I think this is just an easy one to start to get that motion playing and we can do it. We can do it sitting in a chair. So it's really good. So the last thing I want to talk about, because that's four parts and I said we were going to do five and this is not a specific spot. These are spots all over your body and these are your tendons. So, um, I'm sure there are many, many people out there who say, Jen, I stretch, I stretch all the time and it never gets better. 
and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and it's true. Very often that's very true. And the culprit is often a tendon. So I want everybody to really use their imagination. And I want you to think about a, an Italian chicken sausage that you have not put on the grill yet. Okay. You, everybody can see it there. Okay. It's fresh. It's juicy. And the casing is fresh and juicy. And if you grabbed onto the end of the casing where it's rolled up and you pulled on it, the sausage would come along with it, right? The sausage would get narrower. It would move, right? So let's say we have the sausage. We threw it in the fridge. A few days later, we come back. You can tell you push on it. The sausage itself is still good, but the wrapper looks a little dry. You grab onto the edge again and you pull. Oh, guess what? It won't move. Well, shoot, the meat's fine. It should pull. No. The tendon, haha, the layer, the outside layer, the part that attach to the next sausage have gotten dried and stuck. So an analogy to your muscle, your muscle can still be very supple, but if the tendons at the end or the fascia in the middle get dried up and tight and taut, you can't stretch what's in the middle because it's the tendon that's the problem. It's not the muscle that's the problem. Now, the good news is, is that tendons have this wonderful little reflex. I call it the owie reflex. There's actually a scientific name for it. But what they do when you pester them, if you poke at them, they kind of constrict even more, kind of like a, you know, if you, it's going to sound awful, but if you like poked at a turtle head and it popped into its shell really fast, oh God, get away from me. And then it would all of a sudden it would pop back out and it could, its little neck could come out even further. Okay. So it kind of pulls in really fast and then it relaxes and goes, oh, okay, this is good. So there are certain places where we have these tendons where t- people tend to get super tight. And there is a, a method called plucking. And yes, it's as awful as it sounds. Um, You'll know your tendons are fine if you pluck at them and they don't hurt. And you know that they need some work if you pluck at them and it feels like somebody's going to rip your leg off. So some of these places that we will do this to is your Achilles tendon. So anybody who is very uh, stuck in their feet or in their ankles, I'm sorry, if you grab onto the back of that and imagine that that tendon is like a violin string and you grab it and you pluck, 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 pluck four or five times up and down it a couple times, it will hurt, (laughs) but you'll be able to move your leg better. Okay. Another one is that right at the end of your hip flexor, it's the tendon of the hip flexor that runs across your groin. So if you're sitting and you can kind of start to prep press into your groin area, you'll find this little, not little, sometimes it's a really big, it feels like a cord and you press on it. You can't really pluck that because it's too far in. Push, 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 push. There's another one that goes from your inner knee all the way up into your inner thigh. You can either pluck that or really push on it. There's another one that runs from the point of your shoulder up into your neck, your whole trap area. And then another one underneath your, um, well, your pecs. So that, that area of flesh that goes from um, your chest up into your armpit. So I actually, if I'm going to do one thing before I ride, I do all that plucking because it really just allows your body to move more readily. I know it sounds bizarre, (laughs) but I think the the analogy is helpful because I think a lot of people have decent muscle tone, but they they can't get to it. They can't access it. So all of these things that we did are Eckert Miners based. Um, There are many, many more. But again, what we're trying to do here is to allow your body to rediscover its ability to move 
effectively and efficiently. And therefore, if it can do that, it can do that in the saddle. Okay. I was um, busy doing all those exercises. I really liked the way you explained about the chicken sausage, you know, about when it's first fresh and and it can stretch and stretch out and then it's been in the fridge a few days. And I, I was trying to do all those exercises and then I thought, oh, I should write these down. And then I thought, no, that's okay. I can listen to it again. It was certainly enjoyable. To... <laughs> or I can send them to you. Yes, well, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I can send yeah, them to you. <laughs> for sure, for sure. But I really enjoyed the uh, the exercises and just going through. And as I said before, you know, I can see that they are exercises for equestrians because they relate to the way we ride. They relate to the connection that we have between the horse so that we can move with the horse instead of moving in, in opposition. You know, I think that's the key in and, you know, I, I keep thinking about, um, you know, the, the two key things is safety and welfare. And the horse has got to be happier if we're moving with them rather than just bouncing around on top of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I always tell people, I, I, as long as you're balanced, a horse would much rather have you not bouncing on their back, but kind of like a sack of potatoes flopping on their back, you know, because at least you're moving as opposed to a rigid, stiff pole. That is uncomfortable. So movement is key. And the reason, the other reason that some of these movements are key is you'll see, I'll talk to a lot of people, oh, you know, I go to the gym, I work out, I work out. You're working out and you're strengthening things that are not necessarily in the right place to ride. So you need to have things in the right place and then be strengthening the right things, stretching the other things, because otherwise you're going to exacerbate the problem. And very oftentimes I see it, you know, again, with this sort of arched back pel pelvis in the wrong place. Um, if there's one thing you can really do for yourself and your horse is get your pelvis in the right place. You can, you can cover up a lot of other issues if that's working correctly. Um, if you can get mastery over that, um, you're, you're really heading down the right path for sure. Jennifer, thank you for coming and going through those exercises. You know, I think this is one that we, we either need to um, go to, and we'll have it on horsechats.com. Just search for Jennifer, search for movement, body awareness on the horse chat search and um, we might be able to put those up on your page. It won't be the first one, which is 742. It will be the next one. And um, otherwise, people, if you if you go through them once and actually go through them as the podcast is playing, go through as Jennifer's talking about them and then if you need to go through them again and just listen uh, again because I think even in written form, Jennifer, you know, there's a certain amount that you miss out but when you're talking to people and talking them through it you know you get yeah. you get it in a little bit more depth so I think it, it really is to get the best out of it it's just listen to it a few times and say right now I'm really learning from these exercises all right Jennifer we will chat again soon Perfect. talk to you soon bye-bye all right well thank you so very much for having me bye-bye okay. bye if you've enjoyed this chat then please comment rate and subscribe if you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.